Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I wanted to introduce Laurent Escoffier. Can you stand up, Laurent, so everybody can see you? Who's a, a, a visiting Miller professor uh, working with Monty Slatkin, and you're here until mid-February. Mid Mid-February, and uh, where are, are you in Monty's uh, office upstairs? Uh, so, I, if you don't know who Laurent is, you should. He's a, a, a population genetist who's done a lot of work on. Uh, patterns of a population structure, and uh, anyway, he's here until, until February. Okay, uh, it's a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, who's another uh, visiting Miller professor. So Mohammed Noor is a professor at Duke University, uh, and uh, he's here. He arrived in November. He's been sitting in the office next to me. I think a lot of you have probably <coughs> already interacted with him, but he, he's also here through the end of uh, February, or mid to end of February. Uh, so if you haven't, you have a, a, a short remaining time to, to, to still meet Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed received his undergraduate degree from the College of William and Mary, and then he did his PhD with Jerry Coyne at uh, the University of Chicago, and then a postdoc with Chip Quadro at Cornell University. Uh, and that's when I first came to know of Mohammed. Although we didn't, I was also a postdoc in Chip Quadro's lab, but we didn't overlap. We we just missed each other. I left just as he was. Uh, uh, arriving. Uh, he went from there to a uh, faculty position at LSU where he overlapped with Jim McGuire for a while uh, and, uh, and then finally moved to uh, Duke University in 2005, is that right? Uh, and uh, he, uh, he's been there since. He was the chair of the department there for uh, a number of years. Uh, he has uh, many awards and accolades. I, what I want to mention, though, is just his contributions to speciation genetics. So, I, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but Mohammed has published a number of very influential papers, and um, one had to do uh, with uh, documenting evidence for reinforcement uh, in Drosophila pseudo-obscura and persimilis, where he showed uh, that uh, females from a region of sympatry are much choosier than, than uh, females from a region of allopatry. And this was published in Nature in, I don't know, 96 or so, 95, something like that. Very, and it was really, really a very important paper. And then uh, another major area of, uh, of, uh, of work from Mohammed's group has been uh, on the role of chromosomal rearrangements and inversions in particular and suppression of, really, the role of recombination uh, in the generation of reproductive isolation. So in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of interest in this idea that chromosomal rearrangements could contribute to reproductive isolation. And the idea was that in heterozygous individuals for chromosomal rearrangement, there would be reduced fitness, uh, and that might act as a, as a barrier to gene flow between uh, populations. That turned out to, to not actually work in most cases and be problematic for a bunch of reasons. Uh, uh, Partly because those mutations that reduce fitness are very hard to get fixed in the first place. And then the field kind of went through a resurgence uh, around 2001 when Mohammed and a number of other people pointed out other ways in which chromosomal rearrangements could facilitate uh, the emergence of reproductive isolation, uh, not by the effects on fitness of the re rearrangements themselves, but by their effects on, on recombination. So these are really models about recombination and, and speciation, and have been hugely influential in, uh, for the thinking of a, a lot of people. So uh, I personally have been thrilled to have Mohammed uh, here uh, uh, for the, this Miller uh, uh, fellowship that he has. And I can't tell you how fun it's been to have him come to my lab meetings and participate and be supportive of everyone in the lab and in the MBZ more generally. Uh, so, Mohammed, I'm so thankful that you chose Berkeley as your place to, to, to spend a, a few months. And I look forward to hearing what you're going to talk about today. Please welcome Mohammed. Thank you all for having me, not just for the seminar, but also just in general, thank you for having me for these last several months. You know, the, especially the folks in the knock on my I'm constantly walking around like, hey, what's up? Because I have nothing to do, so. <laughs> I appreciate you like, letting me distract you and chit chat about science and everything. Um, so, actually, thank you for that very, very generous introduction to you, Michael. I really appreciate that. Um, like all of you here, I mean, I think just about everybody here is an evolutionary biologist in, in some way, shape, or form, but we're all interested in the processes of evolution, right? We're interested in changes within lineages, so it's just a, a, a caricature here of, of horses evolving over the last 60 million years from small form to large form. 
where we know for changes within a lineage that, that adaptation is important. We're also very interested in the formation of new lineages. So obviously zebras, horses, and donkeys share a common ancestor, <laughs> and speciation is what caused these things to, uh, to separate. Now, what I failed to appreciate all through graduate school and even through my postdoc, much to the chagrin of Chip McQuadro, my postdoc advisor, was, was the importance of recombination to all these processes. And it's not something I ever set out to study, but it's something that every time I study anything, recombination just comes up like, oh, we need to, uh, recombination is playing this major role for every, one, every single thing that I'm, that I'm chasing down. So I'm going to split my talk into two halves. I might give you an excellent intro for one of the two. Uh, the first half of the talk is looking at how recombination affects the process of species formation and how, whether and how chromosome inversions facilitate the persistence of hybridizing species. I'll come back to the second half looking at nucleotide variation and adaptation within species. So as this is an MBZ talk, I want to make sure to introduce my species well. <laughs> these, are, these are the Drosophila subscure for some They look exactly the same, so I don't know which one that is. <laughs> one <of those. laughs> They're estimated to diverge about half a million to a million years ago. It's hard to tell for sure because they do actually hybridize in nature and there's some molecular evidence for gene flow. They do show strong prezygotic isolation uh, in the sense that you know, if a female is presented with a male, the male will court very vigorously usually, but the, the female Absolutely not for a foreign male. There is hybrid male sterility, though the hybrid females are fertile, so that's the conduit for uh, gene flow, and there's some hybrid viability. They're native to North America. In fact, you can find them here. <laughs> it's a great thing about being here. So Drosophila pseudobscura and Persimilis are here in purple, this area of St. Patrick. Drosophila pseudobscura by itself extends its range quite a bit further east, quite a bit further south, and there's an isolated population of Drosophila pseudobscura. It's another subspecies. Uh, we call it sometimes pseudobscura in Bogotana, but it's, uh, it's found in Colombia. There's an outgroup species I'll refer to, which all of you may be familiar from, from Doris's work, which she's worked on the most extensively, probably of anybody, as Drosophila miranda. It's found largely in the same area of St. Patrick as well. Okay. So, again, I'm, I'm most interested in speciation, as, as are many of you here. And in thinking about speciation, we often think about like what's generating this biodiversity, what is actually what is creating all these different forms. I think a little bit less attention is paid to what happens after you generate these new forms. Like, what maintains species? once they actually form, right? Now, typically, the answer to that is usually reproductive isolation, for those of you who are big fans of the biological species concept. But we know many things that we call good species that have incomplete reproductive isolation, where they do interbreed occasionally. Have some hybrids are fertile. There are many good species where we know there's uh, good evidence for interspecific gene flow. So these entities are, rather than being absolute, they're kind of leaky. So in that context, what is actually maintaining these distinct types? And we think of reproductive isolation as being important mostly because of this prevention of gene flow, right, or at least reduction of gene flow at the very least. But one thing I think that there's been insufficient attention to is how reproductive isolation also creates linkage disequilibrium, right? So I'm depicting here uh, species of single chromosomes, and I'm a geneticist, sorry, I'm not that uh, natural history. Right? I'm depicting species <laughs> of a single chromosome here, and, and there's two loci here that are variable. If you were to see a pattern like this, where you see like uh, a group of individuals always have, have both the red and the black alleles of these two loci on opposite ends of the chromosome, whereas another group have yellow and white, you might say, oh, those might be cryptic species. It's a possibility. In contrast, if you were to see something where there's absolutely no pattern whatsoever, it's very unlikely you would consider these two types to be distinct species. So in some sense, linkage disequilibrium is really fundamental to like, these, distinction, these distinct types that we're referring to as species. Of course, you can get this from Alpatrick as well. The ultimate qu uh, question motivating this half of the talk is, does creating LD in ways besides just through reproductive isolation uh, uh, facilitate whether species can persist? And again, not referring to allopatric types, but referring to the types that are actually interacting with each other. So this all started about almost 20 years ago. That's a scary thing to say. So it all started about 20, almost 20 years ago with this collaborative uh, grant that I had with Jody Hay. So, the goal was to have an integrated study of speciation in this group, where my role was to genetically map all the barriers to gene flow, all the reproductive isolating mechanisms between these two species. Whereas Jody Hay had, he had an excellent postdoc at the time named Carlos Machado, who I've continued to collaborate with for many, many years. Uh, he, his role was to survey marker regions for evidence for interspecies introgression. And as many decades of hybrid zone research before this had shown, we expected to see areas which were um, associated with, reprodu with reproductive isolation should also show lower evidence of introgression. Right? Makes sense. <coughs> so let me show you what the genome of these species looks like. They differ by a couple of chromosome <coughs> inversions. If you're not familiar, a chromosome inversion is just what it sounds like, just a flip in a big seg segment of the chromosome. Um, so there's the X chromosome has two of these, it's, it has two arms to it. Second chromosome has one, and the third chromosome has one that's highly polymorphic, where one abundant type is shared by the two species. That, by the way, the third one is the one that uh, Dobzhansky wrote many of his papers on the genetics of natural population. 
uh, these inversions are important because they prevent single crossovers in those regions. So if, you, if you're a heterozygote for an inversion, you, know, you basically will always inherit just the type from Pseudobscura or the, just the type from Persimilis in a heterozygote or hybrid. Okay? So my role, again, as I said, was to map all the barriers to gene flow. So we mapped hybrid male sterility, big sample size, we mapped hybrid viability. There's a hybrid courtship deficiency. This is kind of interesting. For, the F, for a subset of hybrids, um, you present a male with a female, and he just sits there. <laughs> you just say that's bad for passing on your genes. <laughs> <laughs> There's strong mating discrimination by females, courtship song differences, cuticle hybrid carbon differences, lots and lots of, of papers and studies. Unfortunately, I can actually summarize all this with one very, very, very simple figure. Everything mapped just to the inversions. Everything that distinguishes Drosophilus obscura from Persimilis mapped just to those three fixed inversion differences, and most strongly to these two. Right? There was no detectable effect whatsoever outside the inversions. If you tried to quantify if there was any missing variation, it seemed like there was basically none. It essentially fully explained the differences between these two species. This was incredibly depressing because part of what we wanted to do was actually go through and try to find maps of these factors. And like, great, I narrowed it down to like 12 million bases. <laughs> Not very useful in that sense. This also was surprising because it contrasted some earlier studies. There were some studies just shortly before this in Drosophila simulans and Roshan, which by the way are allopatric species, where sterility mapped like all over the genome. Basically, you took any little segment from one species to the other, made it homozygous, and it was associated with sterility. We took a bunch of segments from one species to the other, even like big segments, put it from one species to the other. There was no inversion. It was fine. Even with homozygous, they were fine. With the geographic races of Melanogaster, made preference mapped again throughout the genome. So why are these mapping just these inverted regions? At least just as maybe sympatry or hybridization of this homogenized species. Fortunately, Carlos Machado's work, which came out right after that, supported this idea that, that there's lots and lots of allele sharing through most of the genome, but the only places that have fixed differences are these just outside or very near the inverted regions. This one, by the way, was a little bit of a fluke. There was one nucleotide difference, which actually was a fixed difference. That was the one fluke. But every, everything else matched that pattern overall. So the hypothesis that we put out there was the tube obscure persimilis persist as these distinct gene pools, or species, if you want to call them that, because of differences that are maintained in these inverted regions. <coughs> so one hypothesis for what may have happened historically, it's just one model, there's of course a lot of models with syntax divergence, but imagine uh, a blue chromosome species and a yellow chromosome species, a tube obscure persimilis, and just like your Ziploc bag, if you mix them together you get green. Right? In contrast, in the area where you have the inverted region, that's what's, that's what's keeping things apart. And that maybe recombination was involved. Now, this was just a hypothesis at the time. I'm actually going to show you real data for this. Um, this idea was supported by a literature search that we did around the same time, where we looked across all Drosophila species that were documented. There's a great literature review by Coyne and Orr looking at reproductive isolation in a bunch of different Drosophila species. So we tapped their data set. And I split up the top set here. This is just pairs of species that do not differ by inversions. And these are just pairs of species that do differ by inversions. And they're all similar genetic distance. What you notice is the ones that don't differ by inversions, nearly all of them are allopatric. Whereas you look at ones of similar age that do differ by inversions, many of them are sympatric. There's one exception up here, but it's an interesting one. It's an exception that proves the rule, so to speak. That one species pair, the hybrids are completely sterile. So there's no opportunity for uh, homogenization whatsoever. So that was a pretty striking pattern, and it pushed us forward for looking at this. Now, this is, of course, a cross-species study. We wanted to look at this more precisely. So in doing this, we thought it would be good to do a sympatry allopatric comparison within species. So that's what we did. Our hypothesis is that, again, the gene flow has homogenized regions outside the inversions. Uh, but this effect should be strongest if you're looking at sympatric populations. So we have the advantage that there's a little population of Drosophila pseudobscura way out there that hasn't seen Persimilis in, like, hundreds of thousands of years. Right? So if there's been homogenization from hybridization with Persimilis, here you should see the homogenization there some of the differences should have been retained because there's been no opportunity to homogenize. So we studied this both in the context of no, sorry, didn't run into this. we studied this both in the context of some genetic mapping data of hybrid sterility, and we studied it using DNA sequence data. I'll show you uh, both of those uh, sets of studies, and I'll describe some which aren't depicted here as well. So first, for genetic mapping, sure enough, as, as I said before, with uh, the, with North American Sudobscura, so these are the ones that co-occur with Persimilis, all hybrid sterility lo localizes to the inverted regions. There's no effects outside the inverted regions. In contrast, when we mapped to the South American pseudobscure, sure enough, we found many, many factors outside those inversions, just as predicted. We also did, so this was just done with a single pair of lines because that was pretty intensive. We also just did a general thing where we did a, a, a first generation back cross to us where you make an F1 and then cross it back to either Sudobscura <coughs> or Bogotana. We controlled by just picking out just those individuals that had all three inversions from the same species. When we did that with pseudobscure, almost 100% of them were fertile. 
When we do it with Bogotana, only about 50% or 60% of them are fertile. So again, suggesting that even across a whole bunch of strains, there's a lot of factors outside the inversions causing sterility in, in, in the South American pseudobscure, not in the North American pseudobscure, consistent with the homogenization. We see the same thing when we look at DNA sequence differences, that there's significantly fewer alleles shared between South American pseudopersimilis and between North American pseudopersimilis. I, I just showed the same figure again. I don't want to show a bunch of sequence data. That'll be really boring. Whereas when we look inside the inversions, there's no significant difference whatsoever. Again, very consistent with this idea that there's some homogenization going on outside the inversions. Now, everything I've been showing you so far is just this idea that, yes, they're hybridizing, yes, there's homogenization, and yes, inversions are different. I haven't, I haven't yet shown you any reason to believe that it's a recombinational effect per se. In theory, it could be like, you know, I don't know, increasing mutation rate differences or something else going on in those inverted regions. So we wanted to explore this recombination role. And one way we can do this, we can leverage an interesting little tidbit about Drosophila that not only are crossovers not recovered within inversions in heterozygotes or in hybrids, but also there's a stretch just outside the inversions, which is also, you know, doesn't have any sort of uh, crossovers recovered. So if this recombination role is important, then we should expect to see that effect, that high divergence, extending as far as the recombinational inhibition is extended. Right? So we decided to look at that. The first thing we had to do is figure out how far that recombinational inhibition goes. This was an excellent work done by my former assistant, Laura Stevenson. She found there's basically a complete suppression of recombination until about two and a half megabases outside the inversion. So this is showing the two arms of the X chromosome. The, the yellow here indicates where the inversions are. And I show here uh, different distances outside and how much crossing over there is. And you see, once you pass that two and a half megabase, you start getting a little bit of recombination there. Those of you who work on mammals may think, oh, that's sort of normal levels. Two and a half megabases in Drosophila would usually be a ton of recombination. It would be like 10% of these species recombination. So it's already still pretty, pretty uh, inhibited even this far out. You're just barely getting a little bit to leak through there. So two and a half megabase is the key part. Um, so now that's how far it goes. Now let's see how far the DNA sequence divergence goes. So I'm going to show you a bunch of data. I used to put this all in one figure at first, but it completely overwhelmed on it. So I'm going to break up a figure into a whole bunch of pieces and I'm going to handle on top of each other. So I'm going to show you experimental data from the hybridizing species. Right? I'm going to show you non-hybridizing species. This is, this is an outgroup species, which is often random, the one that uh, Doris works on. There we expect you know, uniformly high divergence, right? It's the outgroup species, so there shouldn't be anything going on. And we can also look within species, both within pseudobscure and within persimilis, where we expect uniformly low divergence. So here's pseudobscure and persimilis. The pink indicates where the inversion is. The orange is about two and a half megabases outside it. Look at that. This is divergence on the y-axis. It just plummets right at that point. <coughs> exactly where we expect it to be. It's not at the inversion breakpoint, but it's right at that other point. If we look at Drosophila pseudobscure Miranda, where we expect uniformly high, it's exactly what we see. There's no pattern associated with the inversions at all. If we look within species, we look in pseudobscure, uniformly low. Oh, I, should, I should acknowledge this is by my former postdoc, Suzanne McGall. Then for similis, again, uniformly low. Now, this is the hell figure. This is the one I always threw people off before. <laughs> but you can see that contrast there. I put a line here showing where the, the pseudobscure for similis one is. So there it's high, and then it goes to low. But if you look at all the rest of them, there's no such pattern. Okay? So that is very consistent with this idea that it's not a mutational effect or about you know, different mutation rates in those inversions or anything like that, but it's a recombinational one. So our tentative conclusion so far is that the anti-recombinational effects of chromosome inversions, this is just in heterozygotes, by the way, or in hybrids in this case, prevents homogenizations in the inverted regions of these species, whereas in the outside the inversion, you're having this, pure, this free flow of genes. Right? So what we've been more recently trying to look at, this is what my lab is currently working on, is how effective are these inversions. I should, say, I should say, when I first put this out, I actually presented this as a talk back in 2001, right before the paper was published, a lot of people were very skeptical. So if you imagine the sort of the pendulum of acceptance was way in the way it was a stupid idea <laughs> and At this point, it swung, and I think arguably swung too far, where like, there are people who were saying, like, oh, this explains everything. You need inversions to get species. Like, no, 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 I didn't say that. <laughs> so there's reasons why. There's reasons why this may not be as extreme as I've portrayed it to you as you look across other systems. Uh, and I've exaggerated uh, in part because I've said that there's no uh, recovery of crossing over within the inverted regions. That's not exactly true. Now, what can happen is if, you, if you're a heterozygote for inversion, you can have, in theory, a double crossover. There's no inherent problem with that. And those have been detected in, in various systems. And you can also have what's referred to as gene conversion. Gene conversion is always called the boogeyman of molecular evolution. Whenever there's something you don't understand, you always blame gene conversion. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically just uh, one, uh, one copy that has a small segment that's copied from the other chromosome. 
of course, I just want to get copied over. So typically, it's well under 2,000 base pairs. It's a pretty small segment, but if it happens a lot throughout the genome, you can actually get a reasonable amount of gene flux or movement of genes between one type and the other type, even in an inverted region. And again, I presented it very, uh, very descriptively right there, but of course, we know in much more depth how this gene conversion happens through the process of double strand break repair, et cetera. So I'm not going to go into that. So the question is, how much do these things happen? How much do we have dual crossover and how much do we have gene conversion? There's a little bit of data on this one, but there's very, very little on that one, gene conversion especially. So how much do inversions affect it? Well, there's some LD-based estimates that suggest that like, you can get uh, some exchange. So this is just using uh, sequence data and estimating LD. There's, of course, some problems with this because it has a lot of assumptions associated with it. There's a lot of theory showing it could happen, but there's very limited empirical evidence. I could only find one study Amazingly published in 1973, so this is me at the time. <laughs> That's the only study that actually looked to see if rates of gene conversion are reduced in inverted regions relative to collinear region. And it was very, very, it was very, very minimalist. I mean, for the time, it was fantastic, but very minimalist. Um, and it suggested that gene conversion rates happen still at fairly high rates. Now, if gene conversion frequencies are high, the inversions probably, over the long term, are not super strong barriers to gene flow. So our hypothesis then, given what we've been seeing for self is obscure, uh, and given this theory, is that maybe there's some double crossovers and some gene conversion <coughs> happening in inverted regions of these hybrids, but probably not a ton. So that's what we've been uh, working to find out. So my former student, Lori, actually worked on the double crossover part. That was intensive but straightforward. <coughs> Essentially, she just estimated double crossover rate uh, empirically. So she crossed species one to species two. Get the heterozygote. This is the inverted region. She basically just surveyed a uh, marker just inside and two markers, I'm sorry, a marker just outside the inversion and two just inside the inversion. Unfortunately, poor Lori had to do this um, manually. So she was looking at the largest inversion, which is about 12 and a half megabases. She screened almost 10,000 progeny, like one by one PCR from them out. And she found one double crossover. <laughs> to her credit, I mean, well, she wouldn't matter if she found zero. <laughs> found one confirmed double crossover in there, and it, it, was, it was very clearly a double crossover, not a gene conversion, because the stretch of it was like hundreds of thousands of base pairs long. So the, the estimated rate there would be about 10 to the minus 4. Now that, honestly, is very severely suppressed, because if you were to look at individuals that don't have inversions, and just look at the rate of double crossover in that same region, it should be about 12%. So there is still a strong inhibition of crossing over, but you are still getting some of these double crossovers. So they're happening, but just heavily suppressed in numbers. Now, what we've been working on more, most recently, and currently, actually, we haven't even published this yet, is estimating rates of gene conversion empirically. And this is the kind of thing that 10 years ago we could not physically do. Like, there was no way to do this. Uh, so what's happened now is we, we cross the pseudobscure to a persimilis, set backwards. We get the F1s, we back cross the pseudobscure, and then we basically just whole genome sequence, the grandparents, the parents, and every offspring individually. Basically just make a genealogy for as many individuals as we can. This is why we couldn't do this 18 years ago, but now it, it's actually quite feasible to do. So what, what do we expect to find? Again, a, gene, a, crossover, a crossover would have this long stretch of copy from one to the other. Gene conversion would be this little, little tiny stretch of heterozygosity among a sea of homozygosity. Those of you who've worked with uh, sequence data may be familiar with the IGV view. I'll just show you that if, if you're familiar with that. So what this is, is this is showing different reads from, um, from a genome sequence. So this is a reference genome. This is an alternate genome. So this, each of these uh, vertical bars indicates uh, an allele that differs from the reference allele. So this is one pure type, this is the other pure type. What we have here is, this is these are clearly heterozygous because you see two different types. But notice this, that stretch of heterozygosity is only this little piece there of a couple hundred bases in the middle. That is a gene conversion, as, as would be depicted from this. So what Catherine did is, um, she went through manually and found some, but then she's been now working to find a, a good automated means for doing this. This is much harder than it sounds because there's so many places where you know, biases can come up in terms of uh, how you're detecting this. Nonetheless, she's been able to confirm many of them. The gene conversion is happening in the inverted region of the X. So this is showing the XR and showing the XL. But you see them sort of spread out throughout there. We don't see any particular pattern to it. It's not like they're all shoved in the center or avoiding the edges. So they seem pretty randomly distributed. In terms of the rates, she's working on, on some corrections now for missing, missing ones. But the rate she has as of right now for um, and, uh, between species inversion heterozygote, it's about 3 times 10 to the minus 5th. For within species inversion heterozygote, it's also about 3 times 10 to the minus 5th. And for within species homozygote, it looks like almost like 1 times 10 to the minus 5th. However, uh, I think this is an underestimate at this point because there's fewer SNPs. There's fewer basic opportunities for seeing these differences. So I think, in, in summary, I think all of these are going to be fairly similar numbers. Fairly similar numbers. So it looks like, in fact, gene conversion is not suppressed in, cross, in uh, inversion heterozygotes of these species. 
this is a quick aside, she has actually found a, a motif associated with gene conversion. It's this repetitive uh, CTG and then three random nucleotides. That seems to be associated with a lot of those breaks, which is kind of neat. So let's put all this together. Put all this together. There are detectable rates of flux in inversion heterozygotes, flux being just like flow between the two inversion types. Uh, about 10 to the minus 5 from gene conversion, another 10 to the minus 4 in the middle from double crossovers. So there's some opportunity for gene flow there. Yet, we still observe these consistently high divergence, both inside the inverted regions and that 2.5 megabases outside it. So coming back to that big question, it does seem that creating LD in ways besides reproductive isolation, in this case using inversions, is facilitating species persistence, but that is not the only thing that's going on there. These inversions are not a complete block. So either hybridization is limited, which we actually know to be true in, in Subscur, or selection local adaptation being implicated in the sense that some things, al although they get to the other type, they then are selected out once they get there. So this is what we've been continuing to work on. We actually have a couple of things in progress right now. Uh, actually, I guess not even really in progress. We have the, the just word from NSF on those countless in progress. <laughs> but, um, my, this is actually a project completely designed by my postdoc here in Samuk. But he's doing a test of the Kirkpatrick and Barton model for how uh, selection might spread inversions within species. That actually isn't even in Drosophila in Subscan for some He's doing that in Lancaster. But it's just a cool study that sort of goes along with all the things we're looking at because it has to do with those recombinational suppression effects of inversions. And Carlos Machado and I are working to experimentally reverse some of these inversions between Subscan and Persimilis to actually map where those factors are in the center there. That one we haven't heard the final word, but we heard it got into high priority. Unfortunately, since this one was funded, they're not so keen on giving us that one. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, it's fair. <laughs> so that's what we're working on right now for this, for that part of the talk. So now I'm going to switch gears, completely different set of questions, and we're going to look at how recombination affects adaptation. That's actually a bit of a misnomer in terms of what I'm actually going to show you. What I'm looking at is why does nucleotide variation within species correlate with recombination rate? This is something that, that Michael has published some influential work on. Many other people here have published influential work on. Obviously, Chip Quadro has. And specifically, is, the, is this association a result of selective sweeps associated with adaptation. So I'll give you some background on this if you're not familiar with it. The ultimate question motivating this half of the talk is what forces have the greatest effects on patterns of molecular variation? That's what we want to know. Now everything I've shown you so far has been looking at the suppression of recombination in species, hybrids, or inversion heterozygotes. But even if you take that out, let's say you just look within a species. And if you just look within humans, for example, recombination rate varies quite a bit across the genome. Right, so this is shown in chromosome one of humans. And you see there's areas where recombination rate is high, there's areas where recombination rate is very low. So this is looking at just in a coarse scale across the whole chromosome. Even on a much finer scale, there is, many of you have heard of these recombinational hot spots that are very, very well observed in uh, mammals and yeast. There's little spots where recombination, uh, where recombination is very heavily localized. Now a very influential paper, this is actually the reason I went to work with uh, Chip. Actually, were you influenced by that paper? Is that why you went there too, or is that? I was already there. You were already there? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, I'm not sure which, yeah, I was yeah. already there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So a very influential paper uh, published in 1992 by Begun and Aquadro showed this positive association between recombination rate on the x-axis and nucleotide diversity, how much nucleotide variation there is on the y-axis. Right? So this is looking within Drosophila and Melanogaster. In contrast, they did not see the recombination was, was significantly associated with divergence, like uh, differences between Drosophila and Pseudobscure. I'm sorry, I'm so used to saying that. Drosophila and Melanogaster and Drosophila simulans. So used to saying Pseudobscure. So they interpreted this initially in the context of uh, selective sweep. So what does this mean? I'm sure most people are familiar with it, but I'll go through it anyway. Imagine you have a neutral locus B with two alleles. Imagine you have another locus A with uh, uh, an allele that's there initially, and an advantageous new one comes in. If there's no recombination, what happens? When little A spreads, because this is the advantageous allele, little B spreads with it. Right? In contrast, if there's free recombination, when little A spreads, it'll sometimes dissociate from little B and associate with big B. So in areas where the recombination is low, you expect, in general, to have <coughs> low levels of variation as you're having selective sweeps happen, whereas in, in, re in regions of high recombination, as selective sweeps happen, they're not eliminating that much variation at all. So there's a couple of different explanations for this pattern. One is that recombination potentially causes mutations, right? In the process of double-strand break repair, you know, maybe you're introducing something uh, bad happening there. Or it could be this sort of hitchhiking spread of bad variance, as I just mentioned. Background selection is essentially the same process in reverse. It's essentially you have this rain of, of detrimental mutations. In regions of low recombination, as you eliminate those bad mutations, you eliminate a lot of other variation as well. Well, that pattern I showed you, the recombination is not associated with divergence between species, was used by a lot of the Drosophila people to argue that, no, it must be mostly hitchhiking. So thumbs ups for hitchhiking, not just, not just my usuals. <laughs> so the Drosophila people very much adopted this idea. 
Uh, now, looking more broadly in other systems, uh, in mice and in maize and tomato, that's the, way, that's the way the author of that paper would say it, it's Australian, uh, there's a stronger association for combination rates of diversity within species and diversity between species. So that's, that's consistent. With humans, you see there's a significant relationship of recombination rates of diversity within species. Oops, is that yeah, there we go. Diverg uh, diversity within species. But there's mixed evidence about whether there's divergence between humans and chip. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, yeast is not a very clear relationship. <laughs> so there's some problems with these past studies that, we, that, that caused us to decide to go and look into this. First is they tend to assume recombination rates are the same historically. So the study I showed you, for example, from Begun and Quadro, all the recombination data they had was just from Linogaster. Right? Now imagine if recombination rates change over evolutionary time. Then, even if recombination is causing mutations, the areas that are high recombination now in Melanogaster may not be currently high in Sibylin. So that those may not be the areas of highest divergence between those two species. And we know that recombination rates are not always the same historically. For example, humans and chimps share a low conservation recombination hotspot, at least on a small scale. This may be true in Drosophila, so the dogma through about 2006 was there's no hot spots of recombination in Drosophila, and only that there's these broader fields of recombination. And this is what drew us in. I was like, what? Why are there no hot spots of recombination in Drosophila? Well, so this was interesting. Like, so this is a quote from a 2002 review. Recombinational hot spots such as those observed in humans and mice appear to be missing in Drosophila. There's also uh, uh, reviews in 2001, 2004, 2007. Like, where did that come from? <laughs> well, part of it was that there's this decay in linkage disequilibrium with physical distance. All right, so that suggests there's some level of recombination everywhere. And that doesn't show that there's not radical differences among areas. It doesn't show there's not hot spots. It just shows that there's some base level of recombination everywhere. The other thing is there's a lack of apparent hot spots of intragenic recombination in one gene, in Rosie. That was the extent of the evidence. So, and it was even, even more amusing. Some of the past studies actually used recombination data, and then they put this third order polynomial interpolation, and smooth it out, and say, look, there's no variation in recombination rate. Like, you just smoothed it out. It was there. You can actually go back to the raw data, and it's sometimes actually very clearly there. So these are the questions we wanted to address. So first, is there fine-scale variation in carbon vector software? We use to obscure this model. We can guess what the answer to that will be. Otherwise, these two would be very short. Mm -hmm. uh, then, assuming there is, is it associated with nucleotide diversity, and is it associated with divergence, and how can we interpret it? So this started actually as a fun project with a, a rotation graduate student in the lab, Liz Cerulli, that's her thought where she crossed uh, strains of line, or strains of superscure that had the white mutation to strains that had the yellow mutation, right? So this is really a good genetics. So this is on the X chromosome. That's why there's only one here, so this is the male to the female. You get these offspring and the F1. So what she then did is she just looked at all the offspring. So you can get non-recombinants with just white or just yellow, or you can get these uh, recombinants with either white, white, yellow, or nothing. With these, we know in every case that there is at least one crossover, or, the, or the, we know there's an odd number of crossovers in between those two markers. So what she did is she picked all those out and then, and then put together a panel of markers between white and yellow and just genotyped them. I looked to see where are the crossovers happening, are they randomly distributed across them. It was a very neat little experiment. I was very proud of her for doing that. Uh, and sure enough, she did find significant crossover rate variation across this little stretch. So this is just like two megabases. It's a very small stretch, and it's not, those of you who may work on Melanogaster, this is not on the tip of the X chromosome. This is kind of in the middle for Sue Obscura. Uh, this is, by the way, our 95% confidence intervals, too. So there's a fair bit, a fair bit of variation as she got to the even smaller and smaller scales. Smaller and smaller scales, she found 38-fold differences between the highest and lowest in rates of recombination. So that was, that was a neat little study, despite that she actually still didn't join my lab. <laughs> but it was a great rotation. <laughs> so we decided to look more broadly. So this is now much more recent data. Um, the, the green there is Drosophila Miranda. The blue there is Drosophila Pseudobscura. This is looking now across all of chromosome 2. And we see there is the structuring of recombination rate across the chromosome. There's areas where it's high, areas where it's low. And we see it also tends to be correlated between these two species. Remember, these do not hybridize. Miranda is the outgroup species, not for similar. Uh, generally speaking, it seems to be higher in Miranda, suggesting potentially some sort of global recombination rate modifier, maybe. It's not something we explore further. So yes, there is fine scale crossover rate variation in Drosophila. Is it associated with variation within species? Well, part of that original study, this is the figure you saw earlier, uh, this is looking at variation recombination. We just picked um, 20, or what was it? we picked seven or eight regions across that across that stretch. Five of them are within 200 kilobases of each other. We just you know Sanger sequenced them and looked at, looked at variation in um, I think it was 10 strains of Drosophila here. Look at that. Very strong positive correlation. You don't usually get those in evolutionary genomes. <laughs> R is 0.9. So yes, there's very strong correlation between recombination rate and diversity. That was at a very fine scale. We went a little bit more coarse after that. So this is looking now across all of chromosome 2 of pseudobscure again, that variation there. 
And again, we still see not quite as strong, but still a strong positive correlation between recombination rate and diversity. You can see the same thing in Drosophila Miranda. Again, there's that structure of recombination rate. There's that positive correlation. So, yes, associated with diversity. How about divergence between species? So we have that data already. Here's that. Uh, here's the um, recombination rate. How does it relate to non-coding divergence between these two species? No. Now, remember what I said earlier. There's this problem that in the past people have only looked at one uh, recombination rate in one species. We have the advantage that we've looked at recombination rate in both species. So in this case, we can distinguish this mechanistic <coughs> explanation that local recombination rates may have changed between superscure and persimilis from the selective explanation. So what we did is we pulled, now this is a regression of recombination rate in Pseudobscura to recombination rate in Drosophila Miranda. We just picked those ones as close as possible to the, to the, to the regression line. <coughs> so th those are ones that we know are, this, are basically the, almost exactly the same recombination rate in Pseudobscura as they are in Miranda. And in doing that, there was still absolutely no association between recombination rate and divergence whatsoever. So that strongly favors that it's not the mechanistic explanation, but it is a selective explanation. So Darwin can give that a thumbs up for his hitchhiker there. <laughs> So, what have I shown so far? Well, this fine scale variation recombination rate exists in your sample. It is associated with diversity, and it's not associated with diversity, which implicates selection as a major cause. So, the gun in Ecuador were right, so yes, we used up a whole NIH grant to prove that a previous study was right, but <laughs> setting that aside for a minute, <laughs> that was something that needed to be done. Now, what, what we've done since that time is try to follow up on it. I'll show you one short study and one slightly longer set of studies that are still in progress. The first one is this question about recombination of hotspots. So I showed you before some fine structuring, but not at the level of sort of the human hotspot. You know, how fine structure is it in, in Drosophila species? What we find is that we worked all the way down to 5 kb windows, and my poor uh, lab manager, Brenda Manzano Winkler, so we had to do a ton of genotyping for this. In doing that, so this is like that, that uh, random picture from humans just showing the data what it might look like. This is it in Pseudobscura. Yeah, no, there's not hot spots. <laughs> there's not that same extremely fine scale structure where it's nearly zero in some areas and fairly high in others. But it's, there is still structuring, but it's not as um, punctate as it is in, in mammals. This is the big question, of course, this is something that people have been working on for decades. <laughs> how much of it is negative or purifying selection removing variation, or the so-called background selection? Uh, how much of it is positive selection? That's something that's still in progress, but I'll show you some data that we have that's, that's, not in, that's incomplete that we've been working on. First, looking at background selection. There's an interesting thing about background selection I think a lot of people don't think about. So positive selection, if you're thinking about the, the standard, typical, hard selective sweeps, those always result in a difference between species. If you have a new mutation arises and spreads to fixation in one species, that you now have a fixed difference. In contrast, negative purifying selection results in a lack of difference between species. Right? So a new mutation come up and it's taken out. Mutation comes up and it's taken out. So what we did is we looked at loci that had just, just those set of, set of loci that had no fixed differences between species uh, and looked for a recombination between the uh, nucleotide diversity and recombination rate. And there's, there's none at all. It's absolutely flat there. We did a bunch of things to, re to subsample the original data. There's a whole bunch of biases associated with doing this. We're picking loci that have long, longer coalescence times. We've done a lot of sort of corrections for it. Everything we do comes back with the same answer. That there's no correlation of uh, nucleotide diversity or recombination. This seems to suggest that, that basically if you take out the hard sweeps, you don't have much residual signature there. It doesn't prove that it's, uh, that it's all hard sweeps, but it suggests that a lot of it should be. Okay, the other way, test for positive selection, what we did find is that we see reduced variation near non-synonymous differences between species. So if you, if you sum across all the non-synonymous differences between species at all these different loci, you tend to see this sort of dip in variation right next to them. Right? In contrast, if you look at synonymous differences between species, you don't see any dip like that at all. That, again, seems to be consistent with the idea that much of this is driven by positive selection, and potentially the sort of hard selective sweeps. It's not definitive, but again, this is stuff that's still in progress. That's just our earlier uh, look at that. So the overall take-home messages from everything, yeah, we'll get on that. Overall take-home messages are, are that restricting recombination seems to allow hybridizing species to persist. That was the whole first half of the talk. The second half is that the combination is mediating this effect of largely positive natural selection on molecular variation. So again, this seems to be having a very big effect on molecular variation. And, it's, and we seem to have been able to rule out this confound from previous work, which we've been very excited about. So what we're working on right now is, um, actually I was literally just talking minutes before I walked into the seminar, my postdoc here, who I mentioned before, he's studying if recombination rates exhibit local adaptation in natural populations. This is sort of merging some of those two ideas together. That if you were to look at two different natural populations, do you see recombination rates being modulated up or down in response to local selection pressures? And we have a large scale pro uh, project involved with that now that he's currently working on. 
This is a project we're just about to begin, which is looking at the forces explaining the hydrogen of lethal in those natural properties. This one hasn't become, this is still just an idea stage, but we're pretty excited about it. But just overall, this role of recombination seems to be multifarious, both in, in terms of adaptation within species and formation of new species. And again, any time I try to study anything, recombination just creeps <laughs> up and, and pokes its head out. It's not like I really cared about like marking of chromosomes or anything like that per se, but it seems like everything in evolution comes back to that. So yes, I have a lot of time for questions, but let me give a couple of acknowledgments first. The Norlap actually did the work, as opposed to around presenting it like I do. Uh, Duke University hired me. I'm going to give kudos for that. I've listed the collaborators. Imagine your picture here for listening. NSF and NIH have funded me. However, given NIH's support of me has faded away, my knowledge of them fades away too. <laughs> <laughs> this is the lab from about 10 years ago. This is the lab I'm currently in. And I highlight especially work by uh, Catherine Cronus, my current grad student, as well as Kieran Samuk, my postdoc. And of course, very important, big thanks, especially to the Not Know Lab. Michael's been a wonderful host. This is everybody in the lab. So there's, there's all the lab, not including the undergrads, and the Learn Institute for supporting me for being here. And MBZ, thank you all for letting me be here. <laughs> thank you. So, I don't know, maybe it's kind of obvious, but you can actually take the nature of the species if you look at the inversions uh, in the result of species uh, uh, that were mentioned at the beginning. And if you just sequence it, would you expect to see more? You do expect to see more diversity, uh, nucleotide diversity within the inverted uh, sequence or difference between, difference between the species. Just because of the earlier coalescence time? Yeah, or, or just because they can actually combine these areas and those regions are excluded and you have homogenization of the sequence. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so it's basically regions, but that. Yeah. So it seems like you're doing experiments to, to test it, but what what do you see if you just sequence it? You sequence the inversions regions. The inversion region, like within species? No, between the two and compare them between the two uh, different species. Yeah, that, that we saw that. I mean, is there, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm exactly. Let me pull up. Let me pull up the chart. Maybe, maybe I missed that particular. No, that's okay. Let's okay, Let me come back to that. Let's uh, back here. So is that is this what you're referring to? So this is this is looking at this is looking between two obscure persimilis. The red, the pink is the inverted region. This is just outside it, and that's uh, the collinear region. <coughs> is that what you mean? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I kind of I kind of thought about it as a recombination event, but uh, it was just uh, nucleotide diversity. That's that's yeah. That's just uh, that's just nucleotide diversity there. Yeah. There's a recombination event like all through this basically in heterozygotes. There's no recombination at all. Obviously, within superscore within persimmons, you get free recombination. Yeah. There. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, <coughs> Mohammed, how do you envision this playing out? So, if you've got allopatric in the first part of the talk. The allopatric one says recombination all over the place there, but the sympatric one, they, they, well, they're associated with these, these um, inversions. That, but do you, do you imagine that, that they're living together and all of a sudden you get, you get an inversion? How, how oh, oh, I see. So that's a good question. So I didn't go into that. Um, <coughs> given that we see fairly different like if you if you were to compare among the three inversions, say let's say you compare the inversion of the two inversions on the X and the inversion on the second chromosome, so you see pretty big differences in divergence time between those three things. Which suggests either some sort of like sympatric association or at least a period of early gene flow. It wasn't like just, they just separated all the inversions of those in this lineage and then and then now they come back together. That we can fairly well rule out. But it seems like there was at least some bits of flux over the over evolutionary time as these inversions were arising. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah based on the different really based cool. on the different coalescence times of the three inversions, yeah. They're pretty radically different. That's yeah. X R seems to be the most recent, but the other two are much are much earlier. Yeah. So the um, inversions um, are associated with thermal tolerance and drosophila along multiple yeah. Well, lines. Through, yeah. yeah. So what came first, do you think? Does the inversion come first and then the, you know, the organism, the genes that are contained within that region are more likely to become, to be used in adaptation? Or does the selective pressure on a particular trait define the region that is so that goes along with the grant that we just got, actually, is to specifically testing the latter of those hypotheses. That essentially, if you have known QTLs, I didn't, I didn't go into detail on that experiment, but we, in that particular experiment, we have known QTLs associated with, uh, I think it's salt tolerance, in that case, rather than thermal tolerance, but the same idea. And we're going to put the inversion then spanning multiple known QTLs doing that. 
I'd like to see how much that, how much uh, more quickly that spread. Mm -hmm. I mean, the real answer to your question is, I'm sure it's both. I'm sure it's sometimes it's this and sometimes that. How much it's one versus how much it's the other, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. But it's a great question. Yeah? So um, in your examples of gene conversion, um, you can imagine there's two ways you can resolve it. Either you end up getting the homozygote for the yes. person who so yes. Do you see a bias and which one gets resolved? So we can't look for one of those, unfortunately. So the problem is if it's heterozygous, let's say that most of the chromosomes is heterozygous and it's going to homozygote, it's very, very hard to rule out that wasn't just a coverage issue at that particular spot. So we've actually only been looking at half. We've only been looking at the ones going the other way, where most of the chromosomes is homozygous and there's a little stretch of heterozygous. I mean, if we had really, really, really high coverage, let's say we had like 100x coverage, which we don't have it that high, we could probably do what you were describing and actually look for that sort of bias. But given just the, given the level of coverage we got, I don't think we can actually test that. I would love to know the answer, though. <laughs> I mean, I might expect there might be some. I mean, obviously, bias gene conversion happens, and I can go wrong and talk about that more than I can at some level. But, yeah, I don't know if it's bias in the sense of, like, goes from one species to, or if one species has a general favor, that I don't know. And I don't think we can look at it with our data set. Mohammed, you yeah. said that gene conversion rates were the same in in the heterozygotes as, as elsewhere, yep. but that uh, double crossovers were much lower. That's correct. Why is that? I have no idea. Well, yeah, we've talked a lot of some of the recombination. I mean, they have to be paired, right? In the inversion. So, rate. in in the polyteens, you know, you know that you get the yeah. inversion loop and things like that. We don't know that's exactly what's happening in the in the, in the actual meiotic ones. So maybe it's not pairing as well there. But yeah, I don't know. I've talked to Scott Holly and other people who work directly on that, and they're like. Same thing with the, the little stretch outside, too. I mean, we're guessing it's just a lack of pairing, but we don't actually know that that's what it is. Sure. Great question. Yeah. Sorry, my answer to almost every question is I don't know. In cases of parallel evolution, there are hotspot genes. Do you know whether you, like, these hotspot genes, they're going to be like in, in inversions? Are there areas, like, that are more prone to breakage for inversions? Is that what you mean? Or when you say hotspot genes, are you referring to in terms of breakage for making an inversion, or are you referring to, like, a, a crossover event? So what, I'm sorry, what do you mean by a hotspot gene that's particularly involved? Like particularly involved in doing what? Like if you lose some structure, then... Yeah. Oh, I see, like, like EDA or one of those kind of things that we're thinking about some of those things. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, for the traits we're looking at, I mean, we haven't gotten to the level of genes for any of those, mm -hmm. so I don't think we can really tell in that sense. Um, I'll answer a different question than the one you asked. Though, just it's an interesting one. Maybe it's not very well formed. No, 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 no. I think it's a good question. I think we just don't know the answer to that one. But I'll answer what I do know. <laughs> in terms of the inversions themselves, if you look at the breakpoints of the of the inversions, both between species and within species, in pseudo obscure, a lot of them are associated with this repetitive sequence. And it seems like there's been some like non homologous uh, recombination that seems to be associated with making those things break. So those those kinds of hotspots we do know are there. I'm not sure about genic hotspots in the sense of these phenotypes. That I don't think we have the resolution to tell, or the replication either. Yeah, in the back. So along those lines, uh, are there particular molar elements or chromosomes that you, when you look across Drosophila that seem to be more enriched for inversions? For inversions? <coughs> I don't think so. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember that. So just in the Superscura's group, so in Drosophila Superscura, the third chromosome has a bazillion arrangements. There's like crazy numbers of arrangements that are segregating within species. And we don't know how much of that is, is um, like a selective bias versus mutational bias. But in contrast, if you look at Drosophila subobscura, which is an invasive species here in North America, every chromosome has inversions. So you see these weird patterns there. I, I don't know of anything like where one particular molar's element seems to disproportionately have more inversions than not. And even if they did, there'd always be that worry that some of this, uh, um, not necessarily a mutational effect, but something about, you know, there's a lot of adaptation genes there, so it's good to capture them. But yeah, I've not seen anything along those lines. Yeah. So when you, you have this, um, <coughs> this inversion in sympathy, so do we know which species actually got inversion? Or? Yes, they're derived in Persimilis. Yes, that we know. <coughs> yeah. Because if you look, if you compare uh, Miranda, I mean, Miranda has its own inversions too, but it, the relative to Sue Obscure, it has the, the same sorts of arrangements in terms of Persimilis. So in all the cases where you have this inversion in sympathy, is it always, always just one species that's been inversion, or do you see inversion in Oh, I've species? never looked for that. No, that's a good question. No, I've never looked at that. It's a great so, idea. <laughs> and also, I mean, since here you have this 
regions of allopatry and sympatry. Mm -hmm. So do you see any kind of polymorphism for the inversions within the... Um, for the interspecies yeah. inversions? Those are fixed. <laughs> or, or very nearly fixed. So the XR one is because not quite fixed. Because is within the range of... Chrysomus is within the range of so zero. Yeah. Exactly. But the, like, the, the one on the left arm of the X and the second chrysomus is an absolute fixed difference. That's actually how the species are, are traditionally were identified. It's morphologically identical. What Dubzhansky would do is bring them into the lab, get their offspring, squash them, and look, and then you'd be like, oh, it's a chrysomus based on those improvements. Mohammed, one yeah. last question. Yeah. I, of course. So, Drosophila are great, but they're weird in the way that they, uh, in the way that inversions suppress recombination, yes. right? It's very different in, in say, vertebrates. Yeah. So how, how general do you think? A lot of this stuff is for thinking about organisms where inversions are not suppressing recombination the same way. I mean, clearly if it doesn't suppress recombination at all, then it shouldn't have any, at least by this model, it shouldn't have any effect at all. I mean, we see, like, even in, say, in plants, there's a lot of these sort of super gene things where, like, the inversion's capturing things together. So I, I suspect it's happening a fair bit, but, yeah, I mean, the more, you, the more you get rid of that recombinational association, the more you're going to lose it, for sure. I think we're lucky in the, well, I don't know if lucky is the right term. <laughs> I think it's clearest in this system just because we have that severe suppression, not only of single crossovers, but double crossovers. I think that makes it most clear cut here relative to other systems. I guess we just don't know how much recombination is suppressed by inversion. No, so we I mean, it's not that yeah. many places. Yeah. I mean, you know, we probably know reasonably well to say like mice, yeast, Drosophila, Rabidopsis, but then yeah. so you go into like crazy species. <laughs> <laughs> crazy species like birds. <laughs> 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 like a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's thank Mohammed for a great talk.